without exception this week, the first question that people have asked me when I told them about my talk is, what in the world is augmented reality? And basically, all augmented reality is, is a use of technology. It's in a way that we use technology to superimpose digital information onto the real world without really detracting from the real world experiences that we have. And I think this is really important, oh, in science education. Um, because in science education, really, science is about trying to understand the natural world that we live in. And often, when we use a virtual reality, we're really losing out on a lot of the information experience that the real world has to offer. And we start out learning about the real world um, as young children. This is what I like to call the uh, perfectly coordinated real-time multi-sensory experience. Um, if you, if, you know, you'd all go to a theater to see that, right? Well, you don't have to. You can go out in your yard because that's the real world. And um, children can learn about the real world really mostly through just going out and experiencing it and smelling things and touching things and eating dirt and collecting rocks and things like that. And the, this is a mountain in Maine called Sugarloaf Mountain. Um, they can go to the beach and they can watch the waves come up and down and dig. And the real world, I'm going to make the argument, is really important in learning science education. If you think about trying to understand the world in terms of putting together this giant multi-dimensional puzzle, you can think of all these sensory experiences that we have as pieces of that puzzle that we add and you know, it, of course, at this age, you're not necessarily putting all these pieces together quite yet. And the young child, um, this is, you know, preschool age, is, uh, gets sort of a naive sense of the world from this. But those puzzle pieces are still really important because you can't build a puzzle without pieces. And parents can do a lot to encourage this. They can uh, have their kids dance around the house, um, plant things in the garden, give them a tennis racket to hit things around, um, art supplies, and all of these little pieces that kids get in the real world um, are very important for helping to build a nice foundation and collect all of their puzzle pieces. And in essence, they are getting parts of, um, let's say, physiology and chemistry and physics and plant biology. Um, I'm not saying they're putting those pieces together yet because that's simply not something that's going to happen at this age. But what I'm saying is that these experiences they have um, are coordinated sensory experiences that are happening. So these are very rich puzzle pieces. Um, now, I'm, I know you're, I'm talking about technology, right? I haven't yet. Um, but my point is I don't think technology has a lot to offer yet at this point. And, you know, um, even in terms of science education, um, this child's making butter. Um, it's Billings Farm in Vermont. It's sort of this living farm experience that's really a lot of fun. And really, when you're making butter, you're taking cream and you're separating it into solid and liquid phases. And it's very much like what goes on in science. So this child maybe is building some puzzle pieces now. Before you think this, I am not saying that making butter is going to make a child into a scientist. I'm not saying that making butter is even going to interest this child in science. In fact, I know this child very well. She's my daughter, and I can tell you right now, she has no interest in being a scientist. Um, but what she does is she's collected some pieces that later, if she wanted to use, are available to put her puzzle together. And she's actually quite good in science class, so I wish you would have an interest in science. So she's about four here. Um, this is when she was 11. So this is seven years later. And here's why I'm saying part of the real world is important. Um, this is a picture, actually, that her sister took. It is a gorgeous picture. Um, I had it on my computer for a long time. And people would say, wow, that is so real. And I'd be like, well, no, not really. It's, it's a two-dimensional picture. It's a beautiful picture. But when you look at this, you just see some mountains. This is a trip we took to the Andes, and it's just outside of Mendoza, Argentina. And as um, you saw from the earlier pictures, we used to live in New England, in the main area. Mountains are very lush in all these things. Um, what I'm getting when I see this picture 
is a lot of sensory memory. Um, I'm remembering the warm wind and the smell of the minerals in the wind at the same time that it's touching my face. Um, there's a strange silence because when you're in New England, there's a lot of bird chatter, tweet, tweet, tweet everywhere. There's not a lot of sound here. Um, you know, and, and I'm just seeing and feeling and sensing things that are very different. Um, and, and so are my children who are older now and starting to put things together. So one of the interesting things about being immersed in this real world um, is that as you get older and you start to take on logic and you see experiences that are different, you start to ask questions. And um, for instance, I would ask, you know, what kind of animal could live here? What does it eat? Um, where do they get water? Because animals have to drink. And then, of course, how many biology questions can you ask your guide before you really tick them off? Would be the next question. Um, so, so it's great to collect all these puzzle pieces, but here's a problem. Um, just sensing the world ultimately isn't enough. And that's why later on what we need to do is we need to find ways to put these puzzle pieces together. Um, and in the science classroom, which is one place, not the only place, but one place that you can start to put these puzzles together, we use a lot of important tools. Uh, we use models of the world that students can use to sort of think through um, you know, their pieces and see if they can match how they put their pieces together and does that match the model that's being given to them, whether that model is a, a verbal model or a physical model that they're building. Um, labs, really important part of science education. Um, really don't do it as well as we used to. In fact, um, I have my eighth grade science notebook. Um, it's actually back there right now. I just decided not to carry it out here. Um, and I can see in that that we used to do, at least where I lived, all kinds of labs. In junior high, I was having flames and putting metals in them, and we did crystallizations and fractionations and all these interesting things that uh, my older child in high school really isn't getting to do, whether that's safety or funding or both, I don't know. Um, but I find it sad because it's an important way to have sort of a controlled sensory experience that illustrates particular concepts and then, of course, in the science classroom, you want to try to bring in as much of real life as you can. So here's the question. If what we're learning about is real life, what in the world can technology do to help us at all, to make this any better? Because who cares? Um, and I'm going to say that I think augmented reality is a technology that can make a difference. A lot of teachers have been really disturbed by some of the technologies that have been used over time because uh, labs, for instance, I said that's an important multi-sensory experience that we have in order to put pieces together and learn concepts. And um, technologists thought, oh, isn't this cool? We can build these great uh, virtual reality simulations. And then you don't have any safety issues and all this stuff. And you can apply it everywhere to everyone. And we can measure them, blah, blah, blah. Here's the problem. Um, you really are missing out. Um, because when you're doing a lab experiment, there are elements of that that have to do with um, seeing, not just seeing, but like hearing sounds, there's smells that occur that add to that experience, and you're getting much richer experience through actually doing these labs. Um, so in augmented reality, what you would do is you'd actually do the lab, but you would use technology to add something to it. Okay. So here's actually what augmented reality is. Here's an example. And this is one of the first examples. OK, see this yellow line? OK, you're familiar with this yellow line? <laughs> it gives you information, doesn't it? Anyone remember before the yellow line? <laughs> OK, what this yellow line does, it tells you how far this guy has to run before he gets a first down so that they can maintain possession of the ball. OK, I got all that information just from a yellow line on my TV screen. Now, the TV screen has given me a real image, but I have superimposed <laughs> something digitally in order to add information without taking away anything from my TV viewing experience, which is really great. And this is really just sort of the early start of what augmented reality is. But of course, I can't carry around my 50-inch TV everywhere, and it wouldn't do me any good because it's giving me an image from far away anyways. So now, 
this is really cool. There's a company named Tektronix that I got this from, and they developed some simulation training for NASA, um, and they're experimenting with augmented reality right now. So this is a um, habitat that NASA is working on, and this is basically um, what you can see is another screen. This is now we have mobile screens, and this is a phone screen. It's looking at this piece of paper, and this piece of paper is triggering this digital image. Now, just like that yellow line, if I was actually at the football game, that yellow line's not there. If you look at this piece of paper, that image is not there. But when you're looking through the screen, this image is superimposed now. And what's great now is that not only can we have a little yellow line, but we have a 3D image that we can interact with. We can turn it, we can rotate it, we can take things apart. Um, this actually can get to the level where you can control things inside this habitat. And even if you like turn on the lights, um, virtually here, it can remotely turn on the lights in the actual habitat that they're building. So we've come a long way from this yellow line. Basically the way that this works is, I mean, we have these wonderful mobile devices now. They're smartphones and tablets and things. And they can sense things in the world. Um, this is a visual stimuli that tells the phone to do something. Um, another visual stimuli, just to use an example that's in your everyday life, is probably these things you see called QR codes, okay, because they're on ads now. You go to Macy's and you scan it, gives you fashion tips, all kinds of stuff you can do. And this is just what you can do with your camera, because your camera can see things on the phone, and it scans it, it says, do this. Um, this is just an example, that's my QR code opening my web page. So no one can sue me over showing anything else. Um, Anyways, but it doesn't have to be a web page it opens up. It can also open up an animation or anything like that. Um, and all kinds of visual stimuli can exist, but uh, visual stimuli aren't the only kind of stimuli that there are. You can also have um, sound activation. But one of the things that I really enjoy the most about um, stimuli or things that are like triggers is something called GPS triggering. Your phone knows where you are. And it has a compass. Well, my phone does. I don't know about your phone. Okay? <laughs> Mine knows where I am. And it knows what way I'm facing. So if I go back to the Andes now, I don't have to annoy my tour guide anymore um, if I had this program. I could go back into the Andes, and I could actually, you know, touch my app, hold up my phone, and at the same time that I am getting all that rich sensory experience from the world. I'm still feeling the wind, I'm still smelling the minerals, I still hear that crunch of gravel under my feet. I can also get my answers, my questions answered. Um, I can go, you know, what kind of animal lives here? Oh, there's a llama-like creature that lives here. And I could probably touch it and get information about it. It's not actually called a llama there, but I didn't have the Spanish word for it. Um, uh, that mountain's 5,000 meters. I can compare it to other things. Um, this, this is just some doodling I did on the picture. <laughs> this app doesn't really exist. But um, it's amazing because if I turn, it will turn with me. And place-based augmented reality was one of the first um, uses of augmented reality in education. Kurt Squire and others um, in Madison, Wisconsin um, developed it a long time ago, as you can see from this mobile device. This is just a PDA, okay? But it still had GPS location on it. And along with interacting with the real world, you can get students to interact with each other in ways that are unique. This is actually a game they're given a mystery to solve. And in Madison, they actually can go out to the lake. And depending on where they are in the lake, um, they get particular information. A student's uh, role play. There's, a, I think, a medical examiner and a detective and a environmental biologists, and they solve this environmental science mystery by interacting with each other and interacting with the world. Um, there's a lot of different uses that I can really see. Um, instant identification of things when you're out in the woods. I know my kids have to go out and collect stuff and bring it back to school, but you're kind of limited um, reasonably in what you can collect and bring back to your classroom. Here, students can collect things on their devices. They can pull up information about it. And you can use like facial recognition technology. Um, so not only does it identify what this flower is, but where it is. 
and it knows the day and time too, so it knows the season, so it can tell you, you are lying, it is the middle of winter, you did not see this flower. Um, all kinds of stuff that you can do with it. And uh, molecular animations are near and dear to me. Um, I'm actually gonna try to work on some genetics, uh, augmented reality with that company, Tektronix, that you saw. Um, and because I'm interested in genetics, I think it would be really cool in the classroom to give everyone their own little QR code at the beginning of the semester. And that QR code means that they have their own special genome. And other kids can go up to them and sort of scan them and scan other kids and see how those genomes are different. Look at the genetics from a molecular level. You can like scroll back and forth between them. Um, so, my lens play. The goal of education is not to increase the amount of knowledge, but to create possibilities for the child to invent, discover, create men who are capable and women of doing things. I put this quote up here because uh, there's a lot of evidence building right now that really one of the things that play does is um, increase our cognitive flexibility. And cognitive flexibility is essential, really, to being capable of doing new things and inventing and discovering, which is, you're gonna hear a lot about creativity, inventing and discovering. Um, this is me, it's my first modeling job. Okay, I played early on as a child, anyone else? Um, but I also had a dad that worked for a toy company. And that was kind of cool, because he'd bring home a lot of toys. Um, this is a toy from his toy company that I was modeling. And, but he also wrote books. Um, his name's Stephen Caney. He wrote toy book, playbook, et cetera. You can look it up if you like. Um, but my entire childhood was all about play and building things. And, but not just playing with things, but in an active way, because my dad's work was play. So because his work was play, I think that um, throughout my life, I really took on a very active role in observing. So when I was playing, I was watching him observing play, writing about play, dealing with invention. And when I say observe and integrate, um, here's a play experience of skiing. And in skiing, um, you can see someone ski, but you can also hear the sound of their ski. And later on when I taught skiing, I'd have someone skiing behind me, and I could hear what they were doing wrong because I'd integrated that multi-sensory information during play. Um, the reason why there's no one else in this is because I'm dead last. Um, <laughs> but it makes a beautiful, beautiful picture. Um, and it's the same thing there with the kinesthetic movement, the sounds, you're integrating this. And then just blasting quickly, photography was a big part of my lens of play growing up. This is a really important day in my life with my father. Um, that is my father, and he's holding me. And I think the reason I remember it so well um, partially is because we have a lot of pictures of this day. And the reason we do is my dad is working with me and, not working, playing with me and playing with the neighbor kids. And he's showing us the camera that he has. And it's a manual camera in those days and you have to make a lot of adjustments. And as he's making a lot of adjustments, he's showing us the different perspectives that we could get in the same backyard over and over. We spent hours doing this and I have lots of pictures of it. Um, and I really put it here because it really sums up, I think, my lens of play, which is looking at things in many ways, from many perspectives, and trying to understand all those possibilities that exist. Thank you. I really appreciate the way you stress in your talk that technology must serve humanity as opposed to vice versa. My first reaction when I first saw the first draft of your talk was, mm -hmm. my goodness, the first 18 slides were all around being a human person, about being a young person, and technology is actually subservient because this could have been a talk about the G whiz part of technology and that would have been the major focus and that would have been that. But I'm so glad you focus on how it can augment, not replace, augmenting reality to help you observe more keenly, maybe accelerate your ability to, to detect patterns and learn from that. Let me ask you, let's imagine it's the year 2017, about five and a half years from today. Mm -hmm. What would you imagine AR to be in that future point in time? If you were to go and talk about AR in five and a half years, what would you talk about? I'd be a rich woman if I knew that, oh. okay? <laughs> because I'd go right now and start that company. Um, what do I think? Well, first of all, I think that because mobile devices are so prevalent, 
Um, I think that education is going to move to be quite more informally. Mm. I mean, I see AR playing a large part. I don't know in the school system how much that's going to be, but I really see people being able to go around in their lives and gather information in their real worlds in ways that they didn't before. I'm hoping that it engages people more in their real world. Um, you, by the way, anyone who has an Android or iPhone or something right now, you can um, download apps right now where I, you may have seen this commercial where a couple's walking down the street and they see restaurants and they want restaurant reviews and they hold it up and there are these little bubbles in the air. Okay, that exists. You can download it today, right now. Um, you can leave a message for someone at a location in the air, or it's not really in the air. Like I said, you look through the screen and that's the tag that it has. Um, I see this really taking over. Mm. I, I see uh, simulations sort of dying off as these richer experiences mm. take place. Let me link what you we're, we're just talked about with Larry's talk. Mm -hmm. With AR, if it were so advanced that you can never get lost, where everything you need to know around your environment is ready at your disposal, would that deny you the chance to react to serendipity? You couldn't get lost. You always know exactly where you are. You know exactly well, where you are. Everything's you you haven't met one of my kids, okay? She can get lost. <laughs> okay, well, and, and one of the issues is, though, I, I think you always have to remember is that technology isn't always available to everyone. And, and I don't know how to deal with that sort of inequity. Uh. Um, plus, you know, it relies on power and energy, which is, you probably, I didn't really hear all your talk, Larry, but I bet he may have mentioned that somewhere in there. Um, so, you know, we've got to balance out those needs. Um, I don't know. This is a very exciting development, and we'll, we'll see where it takes us. We'll see, and, and yes. I'm, I'm hoping it, it sort of backs us off, because I know a lot of science teachers have not been happy with the kinds of technologies that have come into their classroom. Uh, um, they don't feel that they're you know, getting to do as much interaction um, <coughs> with the kids as they might in, at just doing the old school lab. Yes, yes. So. And I also think about what Ahmed was talking about, about how extreme environments often play happens in very modest surroundings where mm -hmm. they can't afford much more than dirt or maybe a, a um, cement a culvert. And I wonder if, if they're somehow they're at, a, as you say, a disadvantage because they probably couldn't afford AR sooner than developed countries. Well, and that's the thing that we wouldn't necessarily want AR to tell us everything or mm. we'd have nothing to discover on our own, mm. too. I mean, when I'm out there in the mountains, I mean, Believe it or not, there's really good cell service in the Andes. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Amazing. <laughs> Shockingly. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, you want the opportunity to intuitively discover certain things. So mm. the, the issue is that not all science is necessarily intuitive. Mm. Um, so I wonder how it might impact dating. If I scan your QR <laughs> tattoo, oh. know everything oh, yeah. about you. Um, OK, this is actually a serious problem. Um, so you should all be very aware of this. Um, facial recognition is pretty well developed. Uh -huh. And someone could develop an app where they could, ne they could just see you walking down the street, pull a picture, use facial recognition, and figure out your name and your address, blah, blah, blah. Your DNA genome? Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> Gattaca-like? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <Joke>. <laughs> so. Interesting. Very open technology. Who knows where it will take us? Thank you so much for coming out to us. Thanks, Walter.